Let's have a look through the papers uh, with Dipti. Um, guess what she's talking about today? It's the British papers, not surprisingly. Lots of reactions there after Boris Johnson's uh, top two ministers resigned, Dipti. That's right. Boris Johnson's finance minister, Rishi Sunak, and his uh, health uh, secretary, Sajid da uh, Javid, have both resigned. And for many of the British papers, it's not so much about those resignations. It's about what comes next. And uh, many of the papers feel that this really does indicate that Boris Johnson is on his way out. Uh, look at the, the all these front pages today from the British dailies. The Sun says, last chance saloon. Boris knifed on a day from hell. Uh, curtains for Bozo, that's from the Daily Star. Uh, the Daily Mirror there, uh, where is the Daily Mirror saying, uh, end game for Boris, going with that rather emphatic one word headline. Finally, I, I quite like Metro as well, going, going, gone. And you see their <laughs> end game as well. Also from the eye, well, two politically uh, opposed newspapers, The Guardian and The Times of London have almost identical headlines. Johnson is on the brink. Yeah, The Guardian are going for it uh, in their editorial, aren't they? What are they saying? Well, uh, they're saying really after the Partygate scandal, Johnson's come under fire now for appointing Chris Pincher as deputy chief whip. In other words, a position where he ensures party discipline. This despite uh, Johnson being told beforehand of sexual misconduct allegations against Pincher. So it's really just one more scandal on top of a, a mountain of scandals. So it's very simple for The Guardian today. They say Britain deserves better than a prime minister who has become a laughing stock. Boris Johnson must go. Uh, a pretty identical message from the Times of London today. Uh, they add that jo Johnson's current situation is a result of the same character flaw flaws that have dogged his entire ca um, career, his persistent lying and his flagrant disregard for the codes and conventions of public life. And on that note, uh, that lack of truthfulness is the focus of this cartoon from Stephen Camley, uh, who you see, uh, um, who sees the statue, uh, a lady of truth saying, hello, stranger, to Boris Johnson, who then responds, who, me? Are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. Well, as we did in the news, um, let's go from the UK to here in France. The Prime Minister, Elizabeth Bourne, she's going to speak in front of the lower house, the National Assembly today. That's right. Cost of living will really be at the heart of her speech, much like cost of living was a preoccupation during the election, Stuart. Uh, it's, uh, you know, Elizabeth Bourne will be presenting two bills that will be examined by the lower house, but one, uh, a lower house that's relatively hostile because Emmanuel Macron, of course, uh, didn't does not have that absolute majority and it's something that Liberation is reminding of uh, reminding us of today. Uh, the right-wing paper L'Opinion, meanwhile, calls it uh, Bourne's first crash test, noting that this forthcoming win will be very difficult for Emmanuel Macron and his ministers who have to sort of seek measures to protect fr French citizens all the while trying to reduce public spending. Not an easy feat. Another big story here in France, one we've not talked about in the last few hours. This is the government's decision to uh, repatriate French families from Syrian camps. Yeah, it's on the front page of the French paper La Croix today. Uh, 35 children and 16 mothers have been repatriated from uh, to France. They were freed from camps holding family members of suspected Islamic State jihadists. It's the largest operation led by France, uh, f and it follows in the footsteps of Belgium and Germany, who did a similar repat repatriation operation. Uh, La Croix, for its part, really hailing the move uh, and applauding the government for, quote, placing the principle of humanity above that of precaution. Now, as tennis fans know, Wimbledon's quarterfinals are taking place today. The British Grand Slam, known, of course, for its grassy courts. Also, though, it's very strict dress code. That's right. When Wimbledon says all white, they mean all white. But what's really interesting is that the uh, independents have been looking at all those times that tennis players have, uh, you know, flouted the rules, uh, perhaps adding a slight pop of colour or wearing mm. something deemed inappropriate at Wimbledon. There was uh, Venus Williams's uh, pink bra that had to be uh, changed <laughs> mid-match in 2017. Uh, <laughs> There was Pat Cash's uh, black and white checkered bandana in 1980, um, 1987. Yeah. Uh, and you have this picture here that's of Anne White. That was in other. So that's Pat Cash. That's Pat Cash I'm yeah. surprised he got away with the t shirt. Yeah, exactly. Both of those. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's more striking. That's Venus Williams with the slight pink. Pink that had to be changed. Oh it was goodness. deemed inappropriate. <laughs> and then you have Anne White uh, two years earlier in 1985. She deigned to wear a white. Skin tight cat suit and white leg warmers. So it was very 80s. It's still her. white. It's still white, but <laughs> Wimbledon, it sort of shocked the conservative old bodies of the tournament. And it actually shocked her opponent, uh, who was a much higher seated Pam Schreiber at the time. Interesting.
Now let's stay uh, on fashion for our last story then. It is Paris Couture Week right now. So um, Tipsy's going to take us through some of the uh, wackier looks this year. Are there any white cat suits in here today? <laughs> no, actually the white cat suit sort of pales in comparison to okay. the kind of pictures oh, I'm going to Let's have you. a look then. <laughs> this is thanks to Jezebel. It's a website de dedicated to women. They put together some of the eyebrow raising oh. looks. Interesting. So there you They're Like this... chocolate boxes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you have uh, on the uh, you have a very fierce look from Iris Van Herpen. Uh, mm -hmm. It's that dress there. I, I think you can call it a dress. Jezebel calls it a wearable <laughs> sculpture because that kind of on fire. On fire. I'm not or, or an angel. I'm not quite yeah. sure what's going on there. Um, there's also a creation from Stefan Djokovic. Um, I don't think there's any relationship to the <laughs> tennis player. Uh, a short, a sort of a bridal dress on the bottom, and you know. Hidden. Eyes wide shut in the top, mm. uh, or horror film. I know I quite like the two <laughs> separately, but not together. Uh, my favorite look, though, is this one from Schiaparelli. This woman, as Jezebel notes, has ripped off her bra, shoved her head into a bale of hay, <laughs> grabbed a chunk of it for the road. <laughs> she's slightly unhinged, but she knows what she wants, and she's not someone you want to mess around with. No, that's true. Even if she has part of a farm on. on I thought it was an head. ostrich. <laughs> But oh, yeah, Bela Hay too. <laughs> Either really, it's for a head to come out at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> and those nipple pasties, of course, we've spoken about before. Let's just talk about those, don't you, Didi? <laughs> Didi Kilarong with the papers, always bringing up things we shouldn't. <laughs> oh, here on Fox Twenty Four. More news in just a few moments' time. Do stay with us if you can. <laughs>